So today we're going to talk about the latest announcement from Intel for not only the 13th uh, gen processor, but also we'll talk about some other things that are going on uh, as well that were announced during that uh, uh, during the innovations talk. So let's dive in. So I'm going to start where I did same quote as the AMD uh, because these type of processors all have, uh, they're all driven by power and thermal limits. So, and this quote is, says, the upper limit on power consumption and thus temperature is popularly known as thermal design power or TDP. Safe and reliable operation of a chip is guaranteed as long as power consumption and heat dissipation stays within the TDP guidelines. This is from a book called A Perspective on Dark Silicon, published back in 2014. The other thing about this is, now true, we do talk about TDP today, but what really has more of a, of a bearing on how much power we can actually give it is max power. So yeah, we pay more attention to that today than we do TDP. So, the other one is kind of confusing. When, when I first heard this when, during the Intel, they said hybrid computing. I may have heard this during the 12th gen, but it just didn't register. But it did this time. And immediately I'm thinking private cloud, public cloud, because that's generally how we refer to hybrid computing is when you have workloads that cross both types of clouds. But that's not what Intel means. Intel, when they're talking about hybrid computing, they're talking about mixing performance cores with economy cores on the same chip. <laughs> yeah, another overloaded term that we have to deal with, isn't it? So the other one is the ITRS. They do predictions like, like uh, this one, which is uh, based on dark silicon. How, in other words, how much of the chip has to be turned off once we get to a certain die size in order to maintain the TDP and for that right now, almost at, at the sizes we're talking about here at 10 nanometers, we're talking about almost 80% of the chip has to be turned off to meet the TDP. That's why max power has more bearing because they can turn more of the transistors on than the TDP would allow. And because, of all, because the CPU has not been keeping up with the demands uh, that we require of it, and it's been falling off since about 2010, uh, and not going up in a straight line as, as we had hoped, we're having to move those loads off onto the GPU in order to still maintain performance. So that's why the GPUs are so important uh, to be paired with the CPU. And I thought it was interesting during the innovations talk from Intel, they were even talking about software that could intelligently place computations on either the CPU or the GPU, depending upon a number of factors, uh, maybe how busy the, either one of those two processors were. We have the 13th gen announcement, and we have, you know, a, a handful of the processors that they had talked about they were releasing. So there's probably, there's going to be more that's coming down the line, but the flagship processor at the top here is interesting from the standpoint of it does have a higher max power. It's at five, 230 or 253 watts, 253 watts. And I think the 12th gen was at 241 watts. The, the base power is still at 125 watts. That hasn't changed. The other thing that didn't change was the price. So that's kind of interesting is that you can get this machine for the same price as the 12th gen. So we have the, the chips will fit into the same... Motherboards, they'll fit in, though they can use the older uh, four D, uh, the DDR4 memory. They can also use the older PCIe4. But they also support PCIe5 and DDR5. So if you want to move it to the newer motherboards, you can do that, or you can reuse your older one if you have a 12th gen. So some of the things that Intel didn't talk about. They didn't talk about that the 13th gen is also a 10 nanometer die. And that's kind of telling. I mean, we've been down this road before. This is now the, 
I believe we had Intel, 11th gen was also was the first 10 nanometer. And then we had 12th gen, which is 10 nanometer, and now 10 nanometer again. So Intel did make a promise, and we'll talk about that uh, as we get through this. Uh, but I, I don't want to talk about that just yet. What about the performance of the 13th gen? At max power on the 12th gen and max power on the 13th, 13th gen, so 12900K versus 13900K, you'll see a 41% increase in multi-thread performance. Now, what's as interesting was if you drop that to the same power level, 241 watts on the 13th gen, you still get more performance, but at a much lower power, right? So, and it doesn't drop a whole lot. It drops to about 37%. Now, why is that? Well, it could be just because of where you're at in the thermal wall, or it could also be because you're able to, as you drop power, you're able to power up more of the transistors. So it could be one or the other. Clearly at 115 watts, we're definitely, that's probably showing more, more transistors coming on. So this is a 20% increase in performance at 115 watts, almost half. Uh, it's a little more than half of the power draw that the uh, max power on the 12th gen would have. So, and then it's, you can also park this at 65 watts and get exactly the same performance that you were getting on the 12th gen. It's pretty impressive. Um, we saw something similar to that with the AMD as well. This one I <laughs> thought was kind of interesting. Uh, how to hide facts uh, using creative use of data visualization. So, yeah, I, I, a lot of people have commented about this. The the uh, the dash line is, of course, the three the the 3D version of the Ryzen chip on uh, the previous generation, where I guess they did not want to give it its own column. Uh, so they kind of hid it a little bit so that they didn't look as bad if they had made that an actual bar. I personally wish they had because, you know, the truth is truth. And if you don't perform well against it, you don't perform well against it. We're going to know anyway. The, the, the uh, reviewers are all going to benchmark it. And they're going to come back and they're going to show you exactly how bad it is. So, uh, And you'll notice as you get over to the right-hand side of the diagram, they do a little bit better. And then the second one I thought was real. And a lot of people have caught this one too, is they didn't even bother to benchmark it against the 3D version of the uh, Ryzen chip here. Instead, they benchmarked it against the older version of the Ryzen, so <laughs> which was kind of interesting. But the questions, again, just like on the AMD you're probably asking is, what support will Linux provide by October the 20th? Uh, and will it run on your favorite Linux distro? Intel has been busy making changes to the Linux kernel since 5.18. Uh, and for the to get ready for the 13th gen Raptor CPUs. So they started working on this way back in February of 2022. So there are a number of kernels, starting with 5.18, that have partial support for the chip in them already. 5.19 uh, contains the 13th gen support for the graphics driver. That's both the S and the P drivers. 6.0 will contain additional support for the Intel uh, 13th gen, and I noticed on the kernel.org today, that's currently sitting at release candidate seven. So my guess, that will be released in time for both AMD and uh, and and the Intel chipset. So that's good news. I, I mean, I was thinking sometime probably uh, in, in the first of November, but I think that's gonna happen on time. So what's in this? It includes the support for Intel's TCC cooling driver. Now, yeah, TCC support has been in the Linux kernel since 5.13, but the 13th gen brings additional uh, controls to the TCC in it uh, that you will need in order to manage the thermals and the power draw. Intel has not yet told us what the thermal information is yet, and I suspect they may not. But we'll discover that as the reviewers start to benchmark it and start to try to overclock it. But I think it's pretty safe to say based on, I'm going to, you know, it's 241 watts for the 12th gen versus 253 watts for the 13th. 
we should see a spike in the in the and I think the power the uh, thermal was 105 uh, degrees uh, C. However, I I mean I did see some benchmarks where it went way above that. So yeah, uh, as uh, as with the AMD, the the secondary question is. Will air cooling still be a thing on the Intel 13th gen, or are we now into the, into water cooling uh, to do this? The Intel promise, what it was that? And at its heart, of course, is Moore's Law. You know, and for decades now, I've been in the debate, you know, is Moore's Law dead? And the answer is no. And with advances in transistors with ribbon fed, advances in power delivery with power via, right? With breakthroughs in lithography, with high INA lithography, the core of semiconductor manufacturing, with advanced packaging technologies, we aspire from today about 100 billion transistors on a single package. By the end of the decade, a trillion transistors. A trillion transistors in a single package. And we are on schedule or ahead of schedule on this audacious strategy that we have said five nodes in four years. It normally takes two years for a node. We're gonna do five in four years. Are these Intel folks crazy? No, we are just torridly moving to the future. And our 18A, right, you know, the key one where we will assert is unquestioned leadership. You know, the PDK 0.3 is in the hands of developers today, and we expect our first test chip taped out against that before the end of the year. We will not rest until the periodic table is exhausted. We will continue to be the stewards of Moore's Law into the future. You got it? Alive and well. That's really aggressive. And given Intel's track record with being able to move easily down the line, uh, I, I don't know if they're doing that work themselves or if TSMC or Samsung is going to be helping them out with that. I don't know. He, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of information there that was not shared. So my take on all of this. During the innovations demo, there was a, uh, a lady there that was from one of the gaming companies. And her message was completely lost unfortunately, due to a problem that she was having with a keyboard. And this, this always happens is that everybody immediately focuses on the problem and not on what was actually being said. To talk about that, I've invited on stage today a world-class game developer, Inflection Games, right, who's striving to bring a realistic, immersive gaming environments onto the PC. Please help me in welcoming Sarah Main Warren to the stage. Um, and when we're working with a multiplayer uh, game that's online, we get networking bugs. And these can really tie up our development uh, schedules when we try and debug them. Uh, and whilst you know, we're very good at doing this, sometimes we don't have any shortcuts. So when we are doing our debugging for these issues, we are connecting multiple clients on a single machine uh, in the editor, uh, usually with a test level. And so <laughs> here's the test level I wanted to show you today. Oh, that's beautiful. Looks immersive. Am I hearing birds? Um, there is a little bit of birds coming out, yeah. yeah. Um, and so this isn't the usual test level that I would use to, to debug anything in. This is a real Nightingale player level uh, running in Unreal Engine 5 um, on this rig. Um, and usually we would be uh, working in a, in a test level that's very small, contained, very empty, so that we can really drill down to what the problem is. But sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes there is a bug or an issue which only shows up in player facing levels. And then we run into problems because we have to run these very high fidelity, dense levels directly on our work machines on a game which is only optimized to run one client on one machine at any one time without the editor even attached. Absolutely. And so you can see that we can, we've got some pretty good performance going on here. It's really nice and smooth. It's looking real beautiful. Um, and uh, on my workstation, you know, back at work, um, this would be what we would be getting in the editor. Um, but we wouldn't be able to connect more than one, maybe two clients before the frame rate just drops off. Um, but on this wonderful workspace, uh, we've not only got uh, one going, oops, excuse me, give it a little punch there. No problem. Oh, well. Uh, sorry, my keyboard is not working. What you can see here is that we, we are running four uh, of these instances all at the same time with the same frame rate. 
Um, and it is a, it, it performs wonderfully. And actually, in back, uh, when I had a bit of downtime, I tried eight. And I was able to run eight of our game instances, which are only optimized for a single uh, on the client at any one time. Um, and yeah, uh, just really impressive tech. I found myself drifting to concentrate onto the problem of the keyboard instead of what they were really trying to say here. So when you get into processors that are uh, that are eight core or above, you're pushing Amdahl's law. You're smacking right into it because Amdahl's law says you need to move to paralyzed uh, execution in order to take advantage of those eight cores because you're if you're in an SMP environment, a symmetrical multiprocessing environment, then you are giving up performance for each core you add on. And it's pretty significant drop that you lose because of the overhead of SMP management. Well, you not only have eight cores, but you have 16 additional on top of that that are acting as your economy cores. So now you've even got a bigger problem. Uh, you've got eight main processor, uh, main performance cores and 16 economy cores that you're trying to manage. And I think what she was trying to say was they couldn't get that either. They couldn't put all this load onto one machine either. And so what I think they were saying was um, well, they had to divide that one machine up into four different machines and then allowed that workload in order to do debugging with four users simultaneously. And I assume it was using some form of VDI to do that. So and that would be my guess. Unfortunately, it just got completely lost in the shuffle. Uh, so, and that would be a good use for this particular type of chip. Uh, it is well designed for that kind of uh, that kind of workflow because when you're in a VDI environment, you you have your your back end machine is doing all of the processing, as well as all handling all the I/O, all the context switching, all of that thing that is going on there. And games are going to be front loaded, right? They're going to want to run in the front part of the system, taking over everything. So yeah, and you know a single application is not going to keep all cores busy. That's just It just can't. Not unless it's heavily paralyzed to be able to do that. That's Amdahl's law. It's unfortunate that that message was lost because I think that's what they were really trying to say there. And that's really an important thing. All right. With that, I hope you enjoyed this video today. Please, as always, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you again in the next one. And bye for now. <laughs>